other little tiny minor podunk conflicts and, and things like that. So 1815 right here. We'll color coordinate. 1815. 1914. Um, in 1815 is the end of Napoleon. Napoleon gets put on a boat. That's the end of the Napoleonic conflict. Now, of course, you do have a series of conflicts that break out. Political reasons, nationalist reasons, economic reasons that break out periodically. And so like the Greek War for Independence, we've already talked about that. The revolutions in 1830, the revolutions in 1848, and there's, there's a handful of, of extra little ones in here as well. Um, generally speaking, during this time period, you have all of the major European nations working together to try to stamp out this little conflict, right? What do we call that, that relationship of those countries? Concert of Europe? The Concert of Europe. Europe. Very good. Okay. Notice, between 1848 and 1871, there's a whole lot of things that go on here real quick. And then, in Europe, you don't have much conflict between these countries. But actually, after 1871, you do have a lot of soldiers from these countries dying fighting, but they're usually not dying in Europe, they're dying in Africa, and East Asia and places like that, as they are gobbling up the entire African continent, uh, turning it into colonies, okay? Everything changes in 1841. We've already dealt with it a little bit, we got that year of revolution. So, year of revolution establishes the, the Frankfurt Assembly, where where the German nations are talking about, ooh, we need some kind of a unified Germany thing. I mean, that's, that's a story all of a sudden that, that comes up. Here's another story that comes up. In the Austrian Empire, all of these different regions in the Austrian Empire start trying to break off of Austria, including, it's the most successful of them, in almost being able to break away. Hungary. Say hungry for independence. Oh. 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 oh my gosh. Okay, mnemonic devices. You have to make sure that your mnemonic devices don't suck. Okay. Sorry. That was bad. Um, okay, so the deal with Hungary, though. The Hungarian movement for independence is successful enough that there's no way that Austria can crush it. And so 1871, because it is a destabilizing influence in Central Eastern Europe, the Russian Tsar sends in a massive army, marches all the way into Budapest, and, and destroys the independence movement Budapest. You're laughing at my pronunciation. <laughs> Budapest, if you're actually going to pronounce it correctly. I mean, for example, pronunciation. G Y. It's pronounced like a J. And so, this is actually pronounced Magyar, not Magyar. How would you pronounce this name? Naj. Naj. Imri Naj, the leader of the of the Hungarian independence movement in uh, 1956. So you know when we get there, you'll you'll have to make sure that you pay attention to pronunciation and stuff. So it is in 1851. 1851 that Russia comes in, crushes this. Hungarian independence movement inside the Austrian Empire and then goes back home and so Austria is able to reabsorb a lot of its territory, right? Now, if Russia does this in 1851, what is the Russian Tsar going to expect in return in the future? 
It's an IOU. They're going to expect help from the Austrians. Okay? So, in 1854, a conflict breaks out. So remember, the instability is created in 1848. 1851, Russia acts, Austria owes them. 1850 war, a war, 1854, a war breaks out. And, and all of a sudden, you end up with about five or six nations that end up fighting with each other and against each other in a period of time that eventually culminates in 1871 with Prussia absorbing the rest of the Germanic nations except Austria and declaring the new modern nation of Germany. At the same time, Piedmont absorbs all of these other Italian nations and becomes the nation of Italy. So, 1854, here's the conflict. Russia has just stamped out the Hungarian Revolution. They've got a much bigger military. They've built up their army. The Russian Tsar thinks that you know this autocratic state is great, wants to expand, and of course, the favorite whipping boy that everyone wants to start gobbling up territory from, especially for the Russians, is in the south. They want a warm weather port. They want to have more access to trade networks. You can't do that if you're trying to send ships out through St. Petersburg or Archangel, where it's not uncommon for things to freeze over in the winter. So Russia wants to expand south at the expense of what country? Who? The Ottoman Empire. Now you may remember this, that the Ottoman Empire had largely been weakening as a result of, of um, you know, the Greek War for Independence and all of these other things that had gone on. Ottoman influence is shrinking. And so if the Ottoman Empire has a full-scale collapse, who is going to be the greatest beneficiary of it besides Russia? Maybe one of these things Austria. we got to get a map. It's Austria. Good job. <laughs> Open. Okay. Map of Europe immediately following the um, immediately following the Congress of Vienna. This is what it looks like, and, and you may be able to see some of it down here. Um, Russia and Austria border on each other, and where they border, like the, the, the border that they all share, is is here with the Ottoman Empire. So if the Ottoman Empire breaks up. Russia is going to be able to spread to the south into the Ottoman Empire. Austria wants to be able to spread this way, Serbia, Bosnia, um, Albania, what is modern day Albania is right here. And so uh, Austria wants to expand this way, Russia wants to expand this way, and so this is, this is what they're trying to do. So what, what Russia needs what Russia needs is an excuse for a war to start, okay? So Russia's got its army together, and so the, the issue that they, that they jump on is, oh, gee, look at this, uh, right, you know, Orthodox Christians, Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, whoever they are, don't seem to be getting taken care of and protected by the Ottoman Empire, so dagnabbit, Russia needs to be able to come into the Ottoman Empire and protect the Christians. How's that sound? Sound like a good plan? Woo! Protect the Christians. The problem is that the Ottoman Empire already has a relationship with France to protect the Christians. So what has Russia just done? They have just insulted France. Okay? 
So understanding, kind of expecting that the Ottomans would say no, the Russian army is already on the move and has already entered um, Ottoman territory and it's beating up on, on the Ottomans, kind of pushing the border south. So the Ottoman Empire and Russia is already at war. Um, when all of this starts up, attitudes in France are like explosive. France is on the verge of war until, unfortunately this map doesn't go much further south, right off the coast of Turkey, of modern day Turkey, there's an Ottoman fleet that is attacked by and sunk by a Russian fleet, which not only destroys a lot of Ottoman influence, but it also now looks like a threat on shipping in the Black Sea. So what country is now going to be the most concerned about threats to shipping in international waters? Who? Well, not, well, Crimea is, is Ottoman territory. What other country? Who? England. Okay? So we need, to, we need to understand something right here, right now. Trade is the lifeblood of the British Empire. Absolutely, absolutely. Any threat to trade is something that Great Britain is not going to take lightly. They are going to go to war to protect trade. So, France, Great Britain... And a very important additional nation comes along for the ride. Piedmont. So France declares war on, on Russia, Great Britain declares war on Russia, and in the process, little scrappy Piedmont declares war on Russia as well. So the Piedmontese soldiers are put obviously under their own generals. And so if you were to see a battlefield, you would have the French army on one side, the Russian army on one side, and one flank of the French army would be occupied by Piedmontese soldiers, where the Piedmontese generals were getting overall commands from the French generals. And so it's like an extension of the French army. Is, is France going to be happy to have Piedmont coming along? Absolutely, yes. Why is Piedmont coming along? Well, no one really knows why. <laughs> okay? Except, except that the guy that's calling Piedmont's foreign policy shots knows exactly what he's doing. The guy's name is Camilo Cavour. You are going to know his name. Okay? Cavour is to Piedmont what Bismarck is to Prussia. Imagine mid-19th century, both of these two politicians as disciples of Machiavelli. Why is Piedmont going to war? Well, that's what we have to figure out. Okay, so... For the most part, we don't really need to pay much attention to anything at all in this war. The war is kind of like a, eh, you know, so, so, so here's the basic strategy. Um, Ottoman military on French and British Navy sail into the, sail into the Black Sea. Let's see if I've got a... Okay, here you go. This is the Black Sea. That's the Crimean Peninsula. Um, right here, the southern tip of the Crimean Peninsula is kind of a peninsula that juts out. You've got, I, you've got the city of Sebastopol. The strategy from France and Great Britain was capture the city of Sebastopol, and the Russians are going to the Russians are going to talk peace. So the whole goal by these two countries for the entire uh, for the entire war capture Sebastopol. So they land north of Sebastopol, they march around the city because there's no good landing zones anywhere close to the city that they can get to. There's a little tiny port down here south of the city 
about 10 miles away at a place called Balaclava. Not baklava, which is a honey-based food, which is really, really oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, but Balaclava was a city with a port that the English and French captured, and so they were able to bring the English Navy into harbor here at Balaclava. So the most important piece of real estate for the British was the supply route between Balaclava and Sevastopol. So the only battle that anyone has ever heard about in this entire war is the Battle of Balaclava. Generally speaking, for the entire war, the British soldiers were unprepared. French soldiers were unprepared. Consider it was 30 years, wait, 40 years. 40 years between the last time that England had been involved in any major power war, and they're now fighting against the Russians. No one has practical military experience. No one understands command and control and, and logistics and things like that, so it's very common that food would not get to the soldiers. Um, you had people dying of starvation. You have people dying of hunger. That is starvation. You have people dying of, of exposure. Uh, it's cold. It's really cold. Like the winter here, um, you know, the uh, the Olympics at Sochi, that's like right on the other side of the Black Coat or the, the Black Sea, not that far away from the water. This is cold. Okay? Um, so it's, it's kind of an epic disaster for the conditions that the British soldiers are fighting in. It makes this a, for a very expensive war. Now, the battle itself was really crappy because the a lot of the leadership that the British had, at the time it was possible, if you had enough money, you could buy a position in the army if you're British aristocracy. And so you had people purchasing commissions. The best example of someone purchasing a commission was a British officer by the name of Lord Cardigan. Lord Cardigan. Now, one thing about Cardigan is that after the Battle of Balaclava, he, um, he complains about not feeling well. He asks the superiors if he can go home. Uh, he is released from his military service. He goes home and becomes an instant hero. And so everyone wants to be like Lord Cardigan. Uh, the fact that he discovered this woven jacket in, in the Ottoman Empire, in Turkey, uh, meant that the jacket became popular in England and everyone owned a cardigan at the time when the rest of his light brigade finally got home. The survivors of the light brigade finally got home and said what an a-hole cardigan was, but the name had already stuck for the jacket. So anytime you put on a cardigan, just remember you need to start acting like a prick. Okay? Now, the battle of the battle of Balaclava, we only have like three minutes left, right? If we have time, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the, the specific Battle of Balaclava tomorrow. I know that I put the, the full, hold, don't put your stuff away yet. I know that I put the full text of it in your notes. If you look at it in context, it makes complete sense. But 